screen. Uh, I'm going to assume that chat can hear me. Uh, I heard the, the, that Maggie mentioned that the, the, she could hear the typing. So I think everybody can, can hear me. Welcome to the last lecture. This is it. This is uh, the last uh, in class meeting for concrete design. A um, couple quick housekeeping items. All the homework is graded. Um, and the same thing is mostly true in steel design. I have like five assignments left to grade on eight, homework 8.4 and then homework 8.5 and steel designs due on Friday. So that one isn't completely done. But in here, we're done with grading. Um, I wanted to also remind everybody of the grading basis, how the grade's computed. So the attendance is worth 5%, the homework's worth 35, the, and each of the exams are worth 20% apiece. So you all can play the at-home game and figure out what you need to get uh, on the final in order to get what grade. I'll go ahead and tell you this now. Um, I do round the grades to the nearest percentage. So for instance, if you get an 89.5, I round that up to a 90 and you, you get an A. Uh, Blackboard might tell you you get a B, but I, I don't go off of that. I just round to the nearest percentage point and that, that's your grade. So if, if you have an 89.8 and Blackboard says you get a B, don't worry, you're, you're getting an A. So don't, don't worry about that. Um, I also want to mention the course emails. I had a, an incredible response, um, but one person has yet to do the, the course evals. Um, uh, it's one of two people because uh, out of 21 or out of 22 people, 21 did the course evals, but only 20 have uploaded. So I'm, I'm waiting on one person. So I'll tell you this. If that one person goes ahead and does their course eval and you could do it now while we're uh, while we're going through the review, then I'll just give everybody their full 10 points. But I'm waiting on that that one person. Um, but the the. I want to get sort of into the, the focus of today's lecture, which is the exam, uh, and I want to discuss the logistics and what's on the exam and so on and so forth. So let's just get right into that. Um, first off, um, uh, let's talk about the timing. So I wanted to give you three hours for the exam, but I'm limited a bit because of the exam windows. Okay, I want to show you something so that you, you see what I did and, uh, and why I did it. Um, if you go here, all right, so this is the final exam schedule according to the registrar, and so we meet Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10, so we have our meeting, um, we have our meeting uh, right here, so our exam window is 10.15 to 12.15 p.m., and so what I decided to do was give you from 10.15 until 12.45, because that's right when the next window starts, so it gives you a little bit more time in case there's any technical glitches or anything like that uh, with completing the, uh, the exam, but I want to be crystal clear. It's still designed to be a 50-minute exam. It's not like we have two hours, so I'm giving you a two-hour exam. It's going to be the same as all the others, so it's not meant to be a, a time crunch. And I'm still using my same old rule of three that if I can get it done in 20 minutes, then you should be able to get it done in an hour. So it, I really don't see this uh, an issue with uh, time uh, on the exam. Um, I'm getting a little warning that my video quality may be low. If you all are encountering an issue, let me know. Um, oh, there we go. All right, let's... Um, Let's talk about the, the overview uh, of the exam. So it's going to be consisting of five short answer questions and three conceptual problems, just like all my other exams. You know, I'll have a series of short answer topic-based problems and then three workout problems. Um, just like last time, do me a favor and type out an answer for every question, even the computational ones, because it helps with, uh, with grading. Because I can go through, and if you typed out the right answer and your work looks right, I can grade it quickly uh, and move on. Um, you are going to need to upload a scanned PDF, and I recommend Cam Scanner. I just put this in here from the last exam. I think by now everybody's good with this. I mean, everybody in here has been uploading homeworks uh, regularly, so I don't really see this part being an issue just because you've done it uh, so many times. Let's talk about what's on the exam. Uh, with this exam, uh, it covers uh, the, the entirety of this exam covers topics that we've done online. Um, 
So that would be serviceability, the, the deflections. So for deflections, uh, you need to be able to identify the reasons for serviceability limits. Um, you need to be able to compute an effective moment of inertia. And so that means also making sure that you can compute a cracking moment uh, and the gross moment of inertia and the crack moment of inertia. Uh, you need to be able to compute immediate uh, or instantaneous uh, live load deflections and then be able to compute the total long-term deflections. And, and also, and this goes without saying, but compare it against ACI limits. And I have that uh, in the slides here in a little bit. Um, development length. Um, I have here, actually, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and edit this. I had to compute the development length for straight bars and hooks, but we didn't cover hooks. So I'm just, just for straight bars. Uh, I'll update the PDF uh, on Blackboard uh, associated. But make sure that you can identify the parameters that affect development length. So, you know, like the bar coding, the bar size, the bar location, all that stuff. Um, and be able to compute the development length. Like, you got to be able to do that. Uh, and then finally, the other or the last topic, the one that we've spent the last uh, few lectures on, which is columns. So I want you to be able to analyze and design square columns or tied columns, but I also only want you to be able to analyze uh, circular columns or spiral columns. You don't need to design circular or spiral columns because we never covered that in class. We didn't have time. Um, but you, you do also need to assess all the detailing requirements and all that stuff associated uh, with, the, uh, 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 with the checks. Um, Let's go through the rest of the slideshow. So what I did, uh, this, this lecture is uploaded to Blackboard. It's the last lecture under the new notes. And what I decided to do, uh, and I did the same thing in Steel Design, is I put all of the slides that contained all the relevant formulas and equations so that it was all in one place. So the slideshow has like 20 slides, but I thought that would be uh, good for you because it's all in one spot. Uh, so we have the modules of elasticity of concrete, um, the right here, uh, you know, uh, uh, remember, uh, put in PSI, uh, or you square root of FC prime, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. Um, the effective moment of inertia uh, formula, I put that here. Um, and then this slide also includes the cracking moment uh, expression and FR. Now, I didn't put in here the formulas related to the uh, uh, gross moment of inertia and the cracked moment of inertia, but you can find that from other... Uh, from other lectures. Um, we have the uh, deflection calculation, so computing the live load deflection and computing the total deflection. Uh, remember, you can, in concrete design, you cannot compute that directly. So, for instance, for the live load, you have to compute the dead plus the live and then the dead and take the difference. Um, and then for total de uh, deflection, we take the live load and we add to that the dead load deflection adjusted by uh, uh, long-term effects, and then the sustained live load deflection adjusted by long-term effects. And your time-dependent factor for dead loads, it's always two. For live loads, you look it up uh, according to the following graph. So remember, uh, and there was a couple people that did this on the homework, if it's on this table, like if, it, if the duration is three months or six months or 12 months, you can read it off the table. All this table is doing is listing the values on the plot. Um, so if you look at three months, three months intersects at one, six months intersects at 1.2, 12 months intersects at 1.4. Any time that's in between this, don't linearly interpolate, just read the plot because linear interpolation would assume that it's a line and that's not a line. That's a curved nonlinear plot. Um, but the long-term uh, uh, adjustment is your time dependent factor, which you get from this slide divided by one plus 50 times rho prime. Rho prime is the area of the compression steel divided by BD. Uh, if the there is no compression steel, then rho prime uh, is zero. Um, for deflection limits, I went ahead and threw the slide there, so it's all here. Um, development length, uh, the, the plug and chug expression is right here. Uh, the confinement term shall not exceed 2.5. The product of psi t psi e shall not exceed 1.7. What I did on this slide is if in the lecture notes, there was one slide for each of these, like one slide for the top bar factor, one slide for the epoxy bar factor. I just took all the tables and put them onto one to try and condense it a bit. Um, the confinement term, the bar cover, the KTR computation, all that's here. Uh, and then we get into columns. There's the base equation for column capacity. Um, there's all of the ACI requirements for tied columns, as well as the clear bar spacing uh, limit. Uh, and then the procedure for column design, uh, uh, the step-by-step -step procedure. And then I said, what the heck, let's throw in the uh, 
uh, reinforcement limits for spirals so that it was all in one spot. Uh, so you have all of this in one location. These are the, the, I think, the vast majority of formulas and equations that you would need on the exam. I do want to mention the exam is open notes. So what that means is Blackboard is going to be completely open. You all can use the notes on Blackboard. You can use the homework solutions. You can use the lecture notes. You can use the recordings of the lectures. So the YouTube playlist that posted is still going to be there. You can use all of that. Just don't use somebody else. So that, that means each other or Chad or any of that stuff. But, I mean, you should have more than enough material to be able to take the exam and more than enough time. It's, I'm really not trying to not be a – this, this shouldn't be a time crunch. This should be a, a pretty straightforward uh, process uh, in terms of time. Um, that's all I have in terms of like what I wanted to say uh, initially. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. The floor is yours. So uh, any questions that you all have on uh, everything that we've discussed from serviceability, development length, and deflections, or any questions you have about the logistics of the exam, the floor is yours. Um, if there's any short things I can answer, let's do that stuff first. And if there's anything you want me to work out, let's do that stuff after just so we try and get through everything. Floor is yours. I'll give you all a minute. Can you explain when we have to do the clear bar uh, check spacing and when we don't? Sure. Great question. Um, let me pull up a notebook. All right. So all right. So this is the calcs from uh, the example that we did in class. And so the short answer to your question is that we need to do the clear bar spacing check whenever we have bars within a, a given tie length. So, for example, uh, let me draw a column down here. Okay, so here's the column. Okay, and then let's let's add the tie. Okay, so there's my my uh, my lateral tie. Okay, and let's say that I have a longitudinal bar right here, and a longitudinal bar right here, a longitudinal bar right here, a longitudinal bar right here. You do not need to do the clear bar spacing check in this scenario, okay? The reason why is because what we're saying is that those bars are nestled up in the corners of those ties, and so they've got enough support just from the, the geometry of your tie bar. The issue is whenever you have a bar that's maybe something like this within a given tie length, so maybe something like that. So let's say this was your column. Let's say that that this was the column you were looking at. You would need to check this distance, you know, and I and to be clear, I'm saying that that distance is the same as that one and that one and that one. Um, but what I'm saying is you would need to check this one to ensure it's less than or equal to six inches, but you would not need to worry about that one. So anytime that you have a longitudinal bar within a given tie length is when you check that clear bar spacing. Anytime else, you don't need to worry about it. 
No problem. Is that clear for everybody else? And then while everybody's typing, let me go back to this image here above. Um, the image above shows a, a rectangular column. So you have clear bar spacing that you need to check across the board. But let's say that this column was to scale. Well, which distance is going? Let me let me put some letters here. Which distance is going to have um, a larger clear bar spacing? Is it going to be X or is it going to be Y? Well, by observation, it's going to be X because it's rectangular. That X distance is longer than Y is. So if I was doing the clear bar spacing check on this problem, if the X distance, if I calculated it and it came out to be like, I don't know, 5.9 inches, then I probably wouldn't even bother checking Y because if the X distance was satisfied, the Y distance surely will be. Um, and I have no problem with your with that approach on the exam either. I know in homework she gave us values sometimes just to make the homework smoother. Will you expect us to work out what was given to us in previous homeworks? Uh, that's a great question. Um, here, here's what I will say. I'm going to religiously adopt the rule of three. So if it takes me 20 minutes, it should take you an hour, okay? Um, and if that means giving you intermediate values to make the problem doable, I will, okay? Um, that did, that, that's my first point. Here, here's my second point. I want to test you on serviceability, development length, and, and columns. That's, that's what I'm interested in. So um, it, I'm not testing you on stuff that we did on exams one and two. And I'm not, let me also be clear, you all already took structural analysis. Uh, you, you passed it or you wouldn't be in here. And so I'm not, um, I'm not trying to test you on that stuff again. Now, this is structural design, so you kind of have to be able to do some of that structural analysis. But um, I'm not trying to, I'm really not trying to investigate your abilities on that stuff again because I already did. Um, so that's a long answer to your question. The short answer to your question is if it makes sense and it, uh, ensures that the test is doable within the time limit, then I will give you those immediate problems. It's not a guarantee, but that's probably the best answer I can give you. But again, I'm not, I'm really not trying to give you a time crunched exam. I'm really not. No, no, I understand. Also, I mean, let's make sure that everybody's, again, this is open notes. And so when I said open notes, I also meant the structural analysis uh, guide that we've been using, you know, like the case one, case two, case three, all the, the uh, you know, the simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, one with a point load at mid span, all those analysis aids that we've been using, those are, are fair game. You're more than welcome to use those on the exam as well. And so when applicable, go ahead. I feel like I'm getting let off easy. There's got to be more questions out there. I'll give you all a minute to come up with some more questions.
what is it that we use the effective moment of inertia for again? The effective moment of inertia is uh, used for computing the, the deflection. So if I go to, so first off, this was the effective moment of inertia problem that we did uh, earlier in the semester. Uh, so first off, um, I mean, I'm hoping that the actual process of computing the effective moment of inertia is fairly straightforward. But if you remember, we use that to compute deflection. So if I go to, for instance, our immediate deflections problem that we did in class. So, you know, we had a problem that experienced dead loads and live loads. And so we would look at our first stage that only had dead load on it. And so we would compute an effective moment of inertia, assuming those applied moments and then compute the deflection under that effective moment of inertia. But then in stage two, when the moments increase, the, mo the effective moment of inertia decreases. So it's like as the beam experiences more load, more of the beam cracks, so your IE goes down. And so you then compute your deflections again using a new effective moment of inertia um, to account for that additional cracking. And then you just take your uh, dead plus live minus the dead to get your deflection. So the short answer to your question is where do you use the effective moment of inertia? It's to compute deflections. But the long answer is just going through uh, these examples, the one for the immediate deflection, one for the long term. We also had the example a little while ago where we just went through step by step. How do you compute it from scratch? Oh, no problem. No problem. Please, I want to make sure that it's all, I want to make sure any potential question that you have is, is being answered. I don't want any, any stone left unturned. All right, let's take this one at a time. What is the best way to study for short answer problems? Um, the only thing I can tell you is just uh, maybe go through the notes, uh, to, to read through the, the text of the notes. And also, I mean, usually the way I, I've um, structured the lectures is I try and go through the conceptual stuff first and then do the problem near the end. So if we have a 50-minute lecture, I try and spend the first 15 or 20 minutes going through the concepts and then the last little bit going through the end. So, I mean, maybe going through and, and either listening to some of the notes. Remember that the, the, all the, everything's available on the exam. It's all open notes and that includes the recordings. Um, so maybe that, that's another uh, option. Uh, now real quick, uh, uh, Mr. Gerald, he asked, uh, will homework 9.3 be on the exam? It's possible. Yes. But the, the, to be clear, um, Austin, I'm not going to ask you uh, anything about designing circular columns or designing spiral columns. I might ask you about the analysis, but not the design. Just that, that we did not cover. It's not hard, and you could probably do it with all of the uh, information you've, you've been provided. It's not like the process is any different. It's the same process, uh, just instead of solving for the width of a square, you're solving for the diameter of a column, but uh, I'm not going to ask you on that. I feel like I'm getting let off easy. There's got to be more questions. <laughs> no. 
Now that's not going to make me uh, grade them any easier, but but I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> I appreciate it. I found out yesterday. Thank you. I could start messing with everybody and say, now I can just fail everybody and they can't do anything to me. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We got to have, have some humor throughout all this. The mistake. <laughs> now that one might actually be true. <laughs> the mistake counter means nothing. Well, he, here's the thing. It's not that it means nothing. It's just and probably instead of seven mistakes, it's like eight now. I have to go check the, the policy. I mean, we can't get crazy here. We have to have some standards. Uh, we're probably, we're getting up there. We're probably at like, I mean, I'm being honest. We're probably up there. We're probably at like Yeah, in all seriousness, that that'll tend to happen with me a little bit more when I'm I'm doing I'm, I'm using brand new examples and fresh examples in uh, in class. <laughs> I feel like an adult asking for an audit, um, but I really did uh, like uh, especially when we started talking about deflections and uh, and whatnot. All of that stuff was fresh material. I mean, I was I was developing it literally. Uh, during during our break because I didn't I didn't want to use the old notes because a lot of those examples assume that we would do them over a couple of class periods and I thought it would be a little more difficult with everything going on with COVID-19 I was like let's try and keep each lecture focused on a particular topic so a lot of that stuff was fresh and so you know you're doing it on the fly and Anybody can hit a plus instead of a minus on their calculator. Um, 8.1 solution has a helpful table. Is that available anywhere else? Um, let me see what you're talking about. Hold on. Oh, I, yes, it is. Um, here, let me show you. Um, so let me it, it is and I, and I want to show you what I did that's that's a really good question so um, let me give me a second so let me open that assignment so that so that everybody sees what she's talking about she's bringing up a really good point um, so let me okay so this is the solution to homework 8.1, and I think what you're talking about is this, right? The um, the uh, the modification factor. So here's what I did. I'll show you what I did. I um, I'm gonna go back to this, which is the this is the very last set of lecture notes that were posted, and what I did here is if you go to this slide, this is slide number 12. This is just that table. I just broke it up so that it could fit on a slide because in, in the code, this, this is copied and pasted directly from the ACI spec. It's just really big. Um, and so I just, I chopped it up a bit. 
Um, here, I'll, I'll show you all something while we're here, because I don't know if at least during COVID, if I've pulled this up, but I'll, I'll show everybody a copy of the spec since, since I have it here. Um, let's see something. See, I didn't make anybody buy the spec for the class because it's like an extra hundred bucks. And, and to be honest, I don't really think that it adds a lot to uh, the class because we don't use as much of it like we do it in steel design, where in steel design, we use a lot. Um, let me share the spec so you all can see what it looks like, though, just because we're all here talking about this stuff. Um, so... This is the ACI concrete spec. Uh, it's one big PDF here. I actually have a hard copy of one. I'll, I'll grab one real quick. So, so this is the, uh, if you want to think of it like this, this is the concrete manual. So it, um, it's, a, it's like this foldable workbook type thing. Um, and, and, one of the things that, about this that it's actually really kind of frustrating to use the first time you start looking at it, because I'll show you something. Let's go to the chapter on beams. Um, so you go to the chapter on beams, and so right off the bat, so the you know it'll say, okay, here's the scope, here's general. Let me show you a little bit about anatomy with scopes when it, or with, with codes. Whenever you look at specifications, uh, a lot of times they're organized like this, where there's like they're in two column format, like there's stuff on the left and stuff on the right. The stuff on the left is the actual code. And then the stuff on the right is the commentary. And so um, the code will tell you what to do. And then the commentary will tell you why you're doing it. Um, so you can always do that. The steel manuals organized a little differently. They have it in separate sections. If you remember the steel manual um, had those gray pages, the ones lined in gray, that was the commentary. Um, but one of the things that's kind of frustrating is this is the chapter on beams and this is chapter nine. OK, and so if you look at chapter nine, it says, OK, if you want to learn about the concrete, go to chapter 19. If you want to learn, go about the reinforcement, you go to chapter 20. And so it'll like you'll open up one chapter and it'll take you all over the place. Um, and so it can be a little frustrating. But once you start looking through it, you'll find that a lot of stuff is um, is pretty familiar. Let me see. Let me go to the columns section. This might be the a good place to um, to start. Actually, no, 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 no. I tell you what. No, sectional strength. This is really good. Sectional strength includes a lot of the fundamental assumptions that we've been using throughout the semester. So, like for instance, concrete stress shall be assumed uh, uh, 0.85 FC prime uniformly distributed. Uh, A equals beta one times C. That's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Uh, and so you can see, you know, chapter 22 is sec uh, uh, sectional strength. Chapter 24 is on serviceability. So this is where you found that deflection uh, table that we looked at before. Um, this is where you find, you know, the formula for the effective moment of inertia and, uh, and whatnot. Um, this is the load multiplier. So it's not like I'm just coming up with this stuff. It all just comes straight from ACI. Um, it's not, nothing magical. So, but to, to get back to my original point, um, this was on development length. This is chapter 25, which is on reinforcement details. This is where you find the formulas on development length. And here you can see these are the factors. And so all I did was copy and paste it from here, and I broke it up into chunks on the slide, so it's a little easier to read. I went off on a tangent, which means you all had time to come up with some more questions. We got plenty of time. What are the main causes of creep and shrinkage? That's a really good question. Um, they're just inherent um properties associated with with concrete so let let me let me say it like this creep and shrinkage cause long-term deflection changes but what causes creep and shrinkage it's it's really just material phenomena specific to uh, 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 
materials like concrete. So uh, she mentioned uh, water evaporation and concrete. Uh, that's actually for, for shrinkage. That's probably the most succinct answer that you could give. That's pretty much dead on. When you mix concrete, you have excess water in the mix. And so take a concrete beam that like a bridge and leave it outside for 20 years. And the water that's inside will evaporate and it will it will you know dissipate and so that causes volumetric changes in the concrete and so it literally causes the concrete element to get smaller but it's not that's not really the super big issue if you have changes in volume you're talking about strain changes like the, the concrete actually you know deforming under this effect and concrete likes to crack and so that's you know shrinkage cracking is kind of the big issue there as for creep, I mean, you have these, you know, crystalline bonds, this material structure where the cement is bonded with the uh, the aggregate and, and so on and so forth, and or the cement paste, I should say, is bonded with the aggregate, and then you get concrete. Well, you take that, you take a load and you put it on a concrete beam and you leave it there for 15, 20 years, and those material bonds start to stretch just under that constant load. They start to give, and so that's what happens with creep is that you get an increase in deformation when the load is constant it's just because of the the, the phenomenon associated with you know with that material effect you don't get that in uh as much in steel um uh than you do in in, in concrete that's not to say there aren't um you know material phenomena associated with metals that are that are unique to metals it's just creep and shrinkage are big ones for concrete when you uh, look at pre-stressed beams where you actually lock in forces, there are six sources of um, pre-stress loss and creep and shrinkage are two big ones. Um, there's also uh, the effect of relaxation where um, if you've ever played a guitar uh, or a bass or any, any stringed instrument, you know, you have the string and it's under tension, uh, but uh, every so often you have to tune the string, you have to tighten it more. Uh, well, from a me mechanics and materials perspective, the, the member the, is, exp is under a constant length, but the force is dissipating. So the force is going down when the deformation is constant. And so it's sort of like the opposite of creep, uh, and that can happen in metals. Why are spiral columns popular in earthquake prone regions? Because um, when uh, when you have an earthquake hit a building, it ex the amount of force that's generated in in the beams and columns is huge. Okay, it is enormous. And so, what your goal is in structural design when it, so so. When you're designing like a, a, an office building or a hospital or a school or whatever for regular old everyday loads, you're doing the stuff we've been doing in class, you know, making sure that PMN is greater than or equal to MU and, and so on and so forth. When you get into earthquake land, your design philosophy kind of changes. The, the one thing that you want to make sure is that when the earthquake is over, that the building is intact enough that people can get out alive. Um, that's, that's really your, your main priority. And so spirally reinforced columns maintain their structural integrity a whole lot better when they get to those, you know, loads up to failure. Um, the, the spiral reinforcement confines the core of the column uh, and, and, and it, it maintains it, its structural integrity enough for people to, to exit the structure and get out alive. Again, that, that doesn't mean that, that we're just going to reuse that column when it's all done and just everything back to normal. You'll probably still have to replace the column or retrofit the entire structure. Nobody's saying that that, that isn't going to happen. It's just if you're talking about earthquake land and you're talking about a scenario where you're just trying to make sure people don't die, then you would pick a, a column where it can, it can hold itself together uh, in that event. And spiral columns do better. Spiral. Spiral reinforced columns though, are a little bit more expensive. The you know, more reinforcement uh, and so on and so forth. So if you're going to use it, you got to have a reason. And earthquakes are a good reason. Did that answer your question? Good deal.
One thing I'll mention to the class, um, like I said, you're going to have more than enough time on the exam to uh, 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 to, to do the, the problems. I don't think time is going to be an issue. One thing that everybody probably wants to to do on, on the exam, especially with the formulas that are really, really long, is, again, here, here's my advice. So here's my, my calculator, right? You've got a big formula. Do the math. Get an answer. Do it again and see if you get uh, the same answer. Check your work because um, I'll be honest, like the, the, the class as a whole seems to be really strongly understanding the concepts. I'm tickled with, with how well you, you've done on the assignments. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but just about every assignment will have submission there, like there was a parenthesis missing, and uh, you know the answer should have been 350, and you got 780. And so as a result, you might pick a column that should have been 18 inches by 18 inches, and you picked like 30 by 30. Not because you didn't understand the concept, just because of little little stuff like like this. So with your with your calculator. So by by just doing it again. I, I guarantee you test averages will go up like four or five percent. Easy. And it's those are free points, you know. Oh, there's gotta be more. We got plenty of time. I have a, um, sure, uh, well, uh, that's fine, but I have steel right after this, and then I have a meeting with actually one of the capstone groups at noon, so, um, okay, uh, I'll call you on team super quick, okay, Af after this. Since development length depends on FY, is it affected by any material properties or failures? In other words, would anticipating creep or cracking affect it in practice? Um, th that's an interesting question. I, here, here's what I'll say. Um, development length uh, problems are not necessarily problems that are a function of time. They're not, it's not we're worried about the, the development length on day one versus the development length 50 years down the line. That, in all honesty, that might be an interesting research question that, you know, you, you, you design a, a structure that is using development length that's like right on the edge. So usually what happens is you compute a development length and if it's like, you know, 23.6 inches, somebody's going to use 24 or something like that. So use, you know, use one that's right there on the line and then have the structure in service for 15, 20 years and then test it to see if you're getting any deleterious effects. That's an interesting question. Um, but uh, for the for the purposes of what we're talking about, no, because usually what you're you're concerned about with development length is here's the member and here's the rebar sticking out of it. If I yank on that rebar, how far does it need to be embedded to achieve FY right now, not now and then 20 years from now? Um, now, so so as a result, does creep affect development length? No, not not really. Um, at least not appreciably the way that that that, that we understand it. Um, now, would cracking affect development length? That, that's a different question, and I mean, sure, I guess it would. If I have a, an element and I've embedded some rebar in it and the concrete's all cracked, yeah, that, that's going to matter. But usually you're embedding the rebar far enough so that hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I went off on a tangent a little bit, but... I, but Short answer to your question is no. I don't think that that for the purposes of typical structural design, you would need to consider long-term material effects. But but um, one thing that is true uh, about development length when it comes to material properties is the yield strength. Um, 
And this, this does affect you on the exam. So if you look, there is a reinforcement grade factor. So um, you would think that if you doubled the yield stress, that you would double the development length. And that's that actually is not how it works. So let's say you have like grade, I'm just going to keep the number simple. Let's say you had grade 50 rebar, even though that, that that's kind of rare. But let's say you had like a, a rebar with a yield stress of 50 KSI and then a grade 100. Well, you would think that if I doubled the yield stress, I would double the development length. It actually doesn't work out like that. If you double the yield stress, the, the, the development length actually goes up disproportionately. So if your development length goes up by two, your, or sorry, if your yield strength goes up by two, your development length actually goes up more than two. So if you're using grade 100 rebar, you got to up the development length another 30%. Uh, and that just comes from testing stuff in the lab. So the yield strength can have an impact on development length, but not creep or shrinkage or anything like that. We got time for a couple more. No problem. What about everybody else? There's, we got a couple minutes. There's got to be a, a question or two out there. Anything else? Well, you are you are quite welcome, uh, Brandy. And and I want to say one other thing before we close everything out. Um, we obviously were stretched this semester. Uh, we ha we've had a very interesting few weeks, um, but. I gotta say the the class as a whole, you all you all came in clutch with with uh, with this um, with this experience. I know that there are times it probably felt like I was giving you a little bit more work than I normally would have given uh, in class, but all in all, you all did a, a fantastic job. Uh, I'm tickled with with how you've done. Um, I, again. I'm I'm really proud of everybody in here. This is uh, you all have have demonstrated a remarkable degree of maturity throughout all of this um, throughout all this process. This is this is this is a first, not just for me, but or for you, but for everyone. And and I think that quite frankly, I think that other students at, at not just at Marshall, but just a, across the country could could learn by the example that you all have set because you've you've really uh, uh, and I'm not saying uh, not just this class, but the, I, I can say this for just the students in general in the civil engineering department at Marshall. You've done us all really proud. I mean, we're we're really tickled with, with how you how you've uh, uh, performed. Um, I'm going to go ahead uh, and sign off here. Um, again, if you all have any questions about the exam, you can email me. We can get on Teams. We can do whatever to hash this out. Again, the exam is going to open on Monday, 10:15 uh, uh, a.m. It is going to close at 12:45 p.m. Uh, if I was you, I would everybody. I would start it, you know, right at 10:15. Uh, but again, it shouldn't be a time-sensitive issue. Um, uh, all and, and one other thing, again, if you haven't done your course evals, not just for this class, but for all the other classes, please do them. We really would like your feedback, not just on 
uh, how things have gone on during the COVID-19 uh, situation, but how things went before that. Um, we really want your feedback because uh, we just want to make sure that we're delivering the best uh, educational experience for you possible. And this is your one chance to tell us, you know, what what we need to hear. So we really do appreciate that that feedback. Um, that's all I have, everybody. Uh, final exams on Monday, and I'll get that. Um, I'll get the the final graded uh, as soon as possible. I, I uh, just just to make sure that everybody has it. I got finals on Monday, Tuesday, and then capstone presentations on Wednesday. So it might be a little bit, but I'm going to try and knock them out as soon as I can. Uh, that's all I have, everybody. Um, I will hopefully see you all in the fall. Um, if you all need anything though in the interim, you let me know. That's all I got.